So hi, I'm Georgina Voss and this is Bigger Than Before. Now in March 23rd of this year, the Ever Given container ship got stuck in the Suez Canal. You've probably heard about it, or seen the photos, or seen the maps that came out of places, um, such as from marine traffic. Um, the Ever Given was really big. Like, container ships are really big and have been getting bigger for the past 50 years. But in that category of really big things, the Ever Given was one of the biggest container ships in the world. It was like a proper monster. Um, it was over 400 metres long. Um, if you want to flip it onto its end, it would be about the same height as a 10-storey building. And this thing just got wedged into the Suez Canal, um, getting stuck there for six days before being rescued by salvage crew. And over that six days, um, it hit the news in quite a spectacular way. There was the very understandable reporting that was looking at it in terms of what this would mean for global supply chains. But there was this extra round of enthusiasm, delight, something much more surreal that also kicked off quite heavily. Um, a lot of memes came out of it. Um, I'm someone who's been very keen on large machinery for a very long time, so I was like quite stoked to see a lot of stuff about container ships coming in, but it was really surprising to see how many other people were so excited about what was happening too. So some of it, like this one, um, reject modernity, embrace tradition, looked at um, the difference between the kind of traditional routes of container ships and global supply chains and what the building of the Suez Canal had permitted them to do um, with this amazing screen grab. Then we got onto stuff like this. Um, this is great. This was um, a dating app put together uh, provisionally for people on all the other ships that were stuck in the Suez Canal. Uh, so that if you were there too, you could meet other singles stuck there. Um, maybe you are a crude oil tanker captain who's looking for a container ship captain, and your vessel is called the Jolly Cabalto, um, and you can find love while you're waiting in the Suez Canal. And then it started getting to the realm of the ship itself. Um, we have here Steal His Look, the cargo ship blocking the Suez Canal, uh, where with a extremely expensive stripy cotton shirt jacket and some Dolce Gabbana jeans and some stickers that you would stick onto a wheelie bin, you too can have the same look as the F Given. There were ones that referenced the, um, well, what the past year and more has been like. Um, this particular photo was quite a common meme template of this little tiny digger, um, which in reality is fairly big, but against the hulk of the Ever Given is quite enormous, um, where you doing your best like comes up against just the heft of the crushing despair of everything from the past year. And so I found this really fascinating. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm keen on large things and large machinery, and I was really curious about just what it was here that got everyone so excited. Now, we're calling in today to kick off the Rainbow's End Digital Festival, um, which is something where artists are exploring digital worlds and digital possibilities and digital creation. And I think what, what I've been thinking about in terms of the Ever Given, um, one of the things that struck me about, I don't say the enthusiasm, but kind of the curiosity about it was it was it was a real thing that had happened. You know, photos such as this one, which looked like they should be photoshopped, um, were not. They are, you know, they haven't been adapted, I think, in any way. Um, and against all the kind of possibility of digital tools, of things we can do to kind of, you know, scale and zoom and build all manner of procedurally generated virtual worlds, I was really curious about kind of like a potential friction between that and people losing their minds over a really big ship. So that was my starting point for what I want to talk about today. I also want to talk about um, an element of queerness that comes through this as well, both in reference to the Rainbow's End exhibition and also how that might help us to think about what kind of scale and heft mean around technology. Um, there's some fairly obvious stuff we can think about, and we will, around size and the kind of the erotics of desire. But there's also things to think about in terms of how we're located, like what do we see, what are our sight lines, what are we expected to perceive. And so this little, um, this example I think shows that really well from um, meat underscore hook. Um, wish me luck lads, he says, he's got the container ship in his sights and he's going to just try and spin it right round. 
Now, the Ever Given was on its way to the Netherlands, where Rainbow's End is being hosted, and its final port of call would, would have been Rotterdam um, had it got there. One of the reasons it was going there is this is one of the very few ports in the world that has been constructed to be able to deal with a ship of this size. Um, the Netherlands itself has undergone extensive, I guess we might call it terraforming over the centuries to kind of claw back land from the ocean, to build dikes and sluices and dams and block and drain seawater um, and build canals, like a lot of which we can also find in Utrecht, uh, where our ex exhibition's hosts are located. And again, like the Suez Canal, a lot of these kind of these waterways and these works have been built for maritime and mercantile reasons to reduce the time um, of sailing for ships and to kind of crank up trade. But a lot of this kind of work has been done not just for more ships, but for bigger ships. So the type of um, ships that might come through now require deeper waters. They require um, larger cranes to be able to lift their goods and yeah, as we can see from these photos, it's not just kind of the cranes, it's also the extra kind of machinery and bits and pieces that come with it as well. So kind of scale begets scale. As things get bigger, um, other things need to kind of shift and change to accommodate these changes in size too. As we, you know, I've just said, container ships themselves have been getting bigger and they're around four times the size that they were 25 years ago. And something like the Ever Given was about as big as it materially could be, like that unless we get some radical shift in kind of material adaptation, um, that's rough about the size that a container ship is going to get. That's as big as it's going to get. But this is part of a much longer history of ships getting bigger from kind of little fishing boats scaling up to um, large wooden ships with sails to then into steel ships and to vet into iron um, and that can be powered by steam. And all of these shifts have wrought with them um, changes in the kinds of not only you know the spaces that they get built in and they get accommodated but even how they get built too um so we have you know the terminology of naval architecture which is describing things that are at the architectural scale like they are that big but they float um you know and you need new tools and new approaches and bigger teams of people to build big things um some of the photos that we've got here, um, we've got this beautiful inside of a hull where you can see the men looking quite small um, and kind of as ships and particularly as um, metal ships has got bigger and bigger, you started to get more mechanised processes to kind of even get rivets through the hull in a way that previously would have been done you know, by, um, by hand. Um, this other machine that we've got here is now retired, hence the um, the fun times graffiti, um, but when it was put to work, it would have been again to deal with big sheets of metal. You know, this is a scale of something you would have found in a shipyard. And we know, you know, as with um, naval architecture, um, non-naval architecture, regular architecture, I guess, you know, we have tool, we have you know digital tools to be able to map out and see both what these big things look like um, as we conceive them, and also then to kind of like map out the building processes to think about the scale, the structure, the size, the quality of the material we use. But at some stage, you know, if you're building something like a ship or a building, you have to come out with software. You have to, you know, actually build the thing. So talking about size in this way can actually be quite difficult. Um, you know, we can talk about things in terms of like the length of container ship, the number of containers it takes, the depth of water. But after a while, numbers are just kind of numbers. Um, unless we've got something to kind of compare them to or, you know, regulate with, it's just, you know, it's just more and more numbers. So then we can turn to description. Um, and these are some photos I found when I was in uh, the Netherlands, it was last summer, um, in one of the maritime libraries there. And there was a book that had beautiful photography looking at some of the port and naval architecture um, around Dutch ports. Uh, but the language of it was just spectacular. Um, you know, it was very florid. There were, you know, these kind of, these floating platforms which are described as giants. Um, there were the, um, again, these kind of, these cranes, these platforms where the language was like big, bigger, best. Um, we have these, um, these devices, these machines kind of, you know, working with matter that are called big boys. And like both after a while, like you realize there's only so many ways you can describe something really, really big. And you also, 
realise there's like quite a lot of meaning that's being conveyed with this as well. Um, one of the sentences in the book was that everything here is big, grand and impressive. Like, you know, we've got large stuff going on. And then you get into spaces where it's just like, oh, wow. Um, there's also quite a lot of other meanings we're loading into stuff around scale here as well. Um, this was a photo taken at one of the visitor centres for one of the ports. Uh, the, the thing it's describing is a concrete key wall that can deal, you know, it's bigger, it's thicker, it requires less maintenance. But it's described here as like sturdy keys for hefty lasses, which are like, all right. Um, and the hefty lasses here are the ships and the sturdy key is the sturdy key. So we've got like quite a lot of meaning in ways that like seem to have all sorts of kind of like secondary identities going on as well that comes with it um so it's again if if numbers are something that are a bit more you know can get a bit more flat like when we get into kind of description it can get like quite heated i guess at times and so inevitably with the ever given um erotica started emerging on the internet you know it can't all be memes um there was written erotica, such as the type we've got here. Uh, this was uh, a piece of slash fiction uh, written about the uh, Mediterranean Sea and the Suez Canal, and the Red Sea and the Suez Canal, and the Ever Given and the Suez Canal. Um, the writer here says, you know, his focus is mainly on the sea and the canal, not the ship so much. Um, also, don't blame me, why am I doing this? Um, there was some other slash fiction that I found that involved one of the local volcanoes as well, with having a nice time with the Ever Given. Um, there was also hentai as well. There was visual erotica that most commonly depicted the Ever Given as quite a curvaceous woman who had uh, got stuck in the canal. So scale is a fetish, you know. Um, macrophilia describes, um, I guess, the effect for, for whom, for people who find either being in the presence of gigantic things, you know, really arousing, or potentially also being thinking of yourself as a gigantic, powerful thing, and that can be deeply arousing too. Um, and there is a, you know, there is a flip side to that of macrophobia, of you know, the fear of gigantic things. Um, but macrophilia has, you know, kind of captures some of these elements of like pure desire of um, being around something which is much, much bigger than you and potentially much more dangerous, like something that can crush you underfoot or you know i guess fall on top of you if you know if you're not careful now there's an element of this in how um edmund burke starts to talk about the sublime um this is from his work the inquiry of the sublime and the beautiful which starts to explore you know what is that thing what is beauty like how do we react to it what are the intrinsic integral qualities to things that we find beautiful in some way and as part of that he investigates size um, and he, I, I think it's really particularly you know given what we've just seen there's some really super interesting stuff about how he perceives the associations with size and the associations with beauty so for small things he says well you know small things can be beautiful but that's not really the point that's just something that happens but he kind of rejects big things outright being objects of love you know what he talks about here is that it's impossible to suppose a giant the object of love when we let our imagination loose in romance the ideas we naturally annex to that size um to are those of tyranny cruelty injustice and everything horrid and abominable like there's something like intrinsically terrifying and awful about big things which means we can't just accept them as you know in a loving tender way but that's not to write them off what he talks about instead is the idea of the sublime um where they, we kind of rather than it being love or affection it's something that's actually really visceral and overwhelming that you know overcomes us in the presence of these enormous god scale things as he talks about Whatever is fitted in any sort to excite the ideas of pain and danger, that is to say, whatever is, whatever is in any sort terrible, or is conversant about terrible objects, or operates in a manner analogous to terror, is a source of the sublime. That is, it is productive of the strongest emotion which the mind is capable of feeling. So this, this kind of goes almost, you know, beyond desire into something which is like far more like completely in the body like not just arousal but something that completely takes us over 
And I find this really interesting, again, when we're thinking about where this might um, fit in with the idea of the feel of size as well, um, particularly if we're remembering that, we, you know, for anyone who wasn't actually at the Suez Canal at that point, we were only ever seeing these images through a screen. And this is something that David E. Nye talks about, um, particularly in relation to what he describes as technological sublime. So you've probably seen, I'm sure, um, shipping containers somewhere either in use, but more likely at this point out of use. So they might be the types of things we have here, they might have been repurposed into buildings, they might have been turned into some kind of artwork, um, but they're kind of, they're just there and they're doing their thing. And you know they're big, like they're big and they're steel and they're solid and they're heavy. Um, but they don't necessarily invoke a feeling of kind of visceral terror unless you kind of see them actually at a point of danger, which might be if you're in a shipping yard or near to a container ship and you actually see them kind of rearing up over your head. Um, this photo here is taken from a photo outside the Rotterdam Maritime Museum um, of one of the containers being lifted up in this kind of like very above you type way. Um, and this is kind of potentially the moment of fear of like, oh my God, that thing, you know, that could fall and crush and kill me. And David e. and I kind of explicates this when he's talking about the difference between um, seeing something which is very beautiful, but like as an artwork, something which has an aesthetic sublimity, um, or actually being in the presence of physically large and potentially dangerous things. Um, he puts it quite bluntly. He says, you know, a volcano, unlike a painting, can kill the observer. And so, you know, you can look at beautiful things at a distance, um, you can kind of remove the terror, and your mind won't be transfixed um, in that moment of just like, oh my god, it's going to fall on me. Um, and you instead can be free to, you know, as he puts it, engage in games and reference and to lose yourself in an interior hall of mirrors, you know, which sounds lovely. Um, but what he describes is that in that moment of terror, of being around really large, potentially deadly things, you have this kind of essential religious experience caused by in the technological sublime direct com confrontations with impressive man-made objects of scale and in that moment you know you relinquish control you realize in the face of these massive things you're actually very small um, and very vulnerable as well and the technological sublime as he describes it um, is specific to a particular point in time. He kind of locates it um, at the turn of the last century, at a point where enormous infrastructures were, you know, starting to be built. Uh, we, you know, we think about big ships, but also things like enormous bridges that were something that the public could come and see. And in that moment, you know, rather than you, know, you have this kind of this development of the technological sublime is about being about something where there are repeated experiences of awe and wonder, often tinged with an element of terror, um, in which people have been confronted with particular natural sites, architectural forms, and technological achievements. You know, which you know, again he talks about in terms of bridges and later in terms of you know advances in aerospace and space flight, and we might we might add container ships into that one as well. Now, there's an argument in this that um, large, large things are having a moment, again, um, forms of macrophilia, forms of kind of scaled desire, um, because, you know, with, with the internet, uh, with kind of network technology, we can find images of these enormous things anywhere we want to. You know, you hit Google image search and you get as many photos of container ships as you want. We also have the tools to be able to um, scale things up and, you know, adapt pictures in any way or Photoshop or collage, things to look bigger or smaller than we want. Um, this is one example. This is a crane simulation program that I came across in a maritime museum where you get to learn how to handle a shipping container crane with some little controls um, to try and give you a sense of like the heft and the scale of it. And it's really difficult. You know, you, I certainly came into this thinking, you know, how hard can it be? And it's really difficult. I did not, I did not do very well at this game at all. But there's some weird stuff that starts to happen when you kind of try to kind of work with scale in digital spaces. Um, on a two-dimensional kind of a plane, you can kind of kind of move things in and out, you can make them bigger and smaller. Um, 
but when you move into three dimensions, particularly whether you know whether it's on a screen or it's a kind of like a VR world that you're moving through, things get quite strange quite quickly as you try to inhabit this world that you're in. So I know that you're looking at me through a screen at the moment. So if you want to take a moment and look up from whatever device you're viewing this on and have a look around the room or the forest or wherever you are right now and try and just let your eyes relax and try and get a sense of how you can determine which things around you are big and little and how, how do you know that and if you take a little walk if you want to just you know, walk around your chair or, or your kingdom um, and think you know as you move how are you assessing what is big and what is little um, it's quite an interesting exercise to start you know thinking about that like some things it come from memory and knowledge you know they're big or little some of it it might be through angles or distance or foreshortening there might be points of comparison that this thing might be big but you know it's big only because it's next to something which is smaller and also our bodies do a lot of the work in this as well um, so these are two photos of me from the end of 2019 with pink hair and two months ago with the blonde hair. Um, I've had a bunch of eye surgery on my retinas over the past while uh, because they've been misbehaving quite badly. And one of the things I found really fascinating after surgery wasn't so much that my, my vision was impacted, although it was, but was my depth perception was just absolutely messed with. And I found, you know, I was trying to some surgeons about this and what we were talking about was you know, as my eye muscles were healing on both occasions of the left eye and the right eye surgery, um, your eye muscles do a huge amount in terms of assessing depth perception. Um, they're constantly kind of like shifting and readjusting to kind of give you a sense of, you know, again, where things are and how they behave. And at a point, say, for example, after surgery, they're still healing and they can't do that. Um, and I was like crashing into things all over, like every, every, building I was in at that point because I just didn't realize you know whether things were near to me or not and that's not you know, the additional part of that is that mostly we see the world again through two eyes so we have stereoscopic vision our brain is doing a huge amount of heavy lifting to you know bring together these different kind of channels calibrate them reassess them again work with the adjustments that the eye muscle is doing all the time to give you a sense of the three dimensions of this world and it's really complex and when you go into digital space, like a lot of that just isn't there or it's done weirdly. You know, it, it, you know um, when you're in um, some kind of digital environment that it's off somehow as you start to move through it, but it can be quite hard to figure out like why. You know, we can think about, we, we know something's different. You know, we don't expect this to feel like the real world and somewhere like Minecraft that's quite blocky and it's quite low res, you're like, yeah, all right, that's, you know, that's what we've got. We know it feels weird, but that's just, a, you know, um, an artifact of it. But a lot of the things that we, you know, again, we use in the natural world to consider about scale, like vantage points and sight lines, you know, are we using a type of vision that's more appropriate for looking at an object or is it more appropriate for a scene? Have we got eye muscle adaptation going on here if we're wearing a headset? A lot of those things, like if they're not in play, they're much more simple or low res than the massive complexity we have when we look at things to figure out how big they are. So kind of there's this strangeness here in these kind of worlds, which can be a little hard to articulate what that strangeness is. And this is something, um, not Minecraft, I think, but this kind of this, I, this element of seeing strangely is something that Sarah Ahmed talks about when she talks about queer phenomenology. Um, she talks about the ways in which we approach things matter, what we see, but also how we are expected to see them too, you know, what we are oriented towards. As she talks about it in this context, you know, if our consciousness is always like directed at something in the world we live in, then it's always going to be worldly. It's always going to be situated you know, to our particular perspective, and it's always going to be embodied in us as well. But we might be instructed to view things in certain ways from certain angles. There might be limits to what we're allowed to see. We might normally only see something from a particular intended vantage point, um, which, you know, as we remember, has all sorts of associations that come with it. And there might also be things as well that are specifically put in the foreground or they're specifically put in the background. 
And that's not only about positioning, but that's also about the values um, that you allocate to these different forms of things as you move through the world. You know, what do we see and which, which parts of them, which angles do we see them from and what kind of normative vantage points are kind of built into how we work with things. Now, some of those vantage points are a little more obvious than others. Um, so this is an image from, I'm sure some of you recognise it, um, this is from Dr Strangelove. Um, and I'm using this to illustrate a wonderful paper by an anthropologist, Carol Kern. Uh, the title of the paper is Sex and Death in the World of Defence Intellectuals, um, which is just, yeah, it's a great title. Um, so for this work, Carol spent time in the world of defence intellectuals, and she's particularly interested in kind of the language that they used as they were talking to each other to describe what their work was, which was, you know, essentially the part of warfare policy. Um, so she was working around men, predominantly men, who, as she described it, used the concept of deterrence to explain why it is safe to have weapons of a kind and number that it is not safe to use. And she found some really, I mean, it's a fascinating paper, she found some really interesting things with this. So the first part she describes is there's a clean language to defence intellectuals. Um, it's a language of acronyms. It's a language where there's technological authority. And what this does is yeah, it imbues the authority that comes with the technical part of the work, but it also allows people working in that space to create this emotional distance between um, the horrors of the nuclear destructive capability. Um, this is what um, military historian and diplom ex-diplomat George Kennan calls levels of such grotesque dimensions as to defy rational understandings and their own personal lives. So you, ha you have this very dry policy language, which you might expect. But she said, you know, but also at the same time, you have this, again, um, quite gendered, sexualized, almost lewd language, which is applied to the weaponry and the processes. So she talks about, you know, um, thrust to weight as being one of the kind of the types of languages of deep penetration. Um, and this, again, these sit hand in hand with both this very kind of like acronym heavy, um, dry language of it's all happening over there and something which is actually much more imbued with like, if not sexual desire and power of like wanting to work with these horrifying weapons. But, you know, having this highly sexualized engagement with them in this way. And this is, you know, partly this, this, the work is specific to the time and the place that she talks about with these and specifically to weaponry. Um, but again, this idea, this kind of engagement with kind of the pleasures of scaling, um, the pleasures of bigness also carry through into technical spaces today. Um, so in the tech sector, the contemporary tech sector, um, scaling is quite a common, desirable idea to scale your company, to scale your product. Now, in her book, The Boy Kings, um, Kate Lossie talks about her time as one of the earlier employees of Facebook. Um, she came in as employee number 51, so pretty early. Um, and she, when she ended, by the time she ended, by the time she left, she was the speechwriter for Mark Zuckerberg. And it's a fact, it's a great book. It's this fascinating kind of memoir documentary of what this early, weird early time was where at that point when everyone realised they had something big on their hands, where they were kind of smashing their user milestones. Um, she talks about how they would close out their Friday meetings with Mark Zuckerberg crying out, domination! Um, and she also talks about the kind of scaled passion for the company as something where you scale first and you ask questions later. And this was something which, you know, in a kind of quite a neutral way, seemed quite desirable. Of course, you would want to scale. And she talks about her kind of, she realizes over time the growing implications of this ideology. As she says, my worry began to deepen when, around this time, Zuckerberg began using the language of states to talk about Facebook's burgeoning power. Companies over countries, he told me once, as we discussed a blog post about Facebook's goals. If you want to change the world, the best thing to do is build a company. So with this, we have kind of like the embodiment of like power being brought into scaling, something highly desirable, but also something quite seamless as well. There's something here about like we build out a company to, you know, surpass and engulf even nation states. And I think this, this feels something that 
I was thinking about this when I was um, pulling this talk together, and it's been something that's been on my mind for a while. Uh, one of the things that came to, it came to mind um, in a way that I, I don't think I was quite expecting was um, some resonance with the film um, from Charles and Ray Eames from 1977, um, Powers of Ten and the Relative Size of Things in the Universe. So this is something, this great, um, I think it's like a nine-minute film, that talk that shows um, what happens when you pull out and you pull out and you pull out in, in the scale, of, you know, to scales of ten each time. So we start with our man on a picnic blanket um, sleeping, and then we start pulling out and we kind of pull out. We come back um, and we get to the city, the coast that he's on where he's sleeping. And we keep going and we keep going and we come out to the universe where this is happening. You know, out and out and out and out and out. You know, ten to the fifteen meters. And then we come back in, and then we go in, and we go in, and we go in, and um, then we end up with our man, but then we keep going in, and we end up on his hand, and then we keep going in, and then by the end, we're kind of, we're down into, you know, his DNA, we're, you know, 100 angstroms deep, 10 to the minus 8 metres, and it's a, it's a great and beautiful film, but one of the things, you know, one of, one of the elements of it, intentionally, is this very kind of out and out and out and out and in and in and in. Um, there's no friction in it. There's no kind of sense of like materiality pushing back and forth with it, or even differentiation that comes with the different components of this fitting together. It's kind of it's this kind of swooping zoom that um, that moves us through the universe and then you know down into the cell. And this kind of the seamlessness is something that has been picked up and um, unpicked. By a number of different people, um, Anna Singh, most famous, maybe not most famously, but she does talk about this in Mushroom at the End of the World, where she says, you know, we have a problem with scale. Um, a rush of stories cannot neatly be summed up. Its scales do not nest neatly. They draw attention to interrupting geographies and tempos, and these interruptions elicit more stories. Um, the point she's, you know, the point she's making, she talks about, is when you define progress as the ability to make projects expand without changing their framing assumptions. This becomes interchangeable with scalability, but scaling isn't a normal feature of nature. You know, not everything is easily set up for expansion. Uh, Paul Darish, in his essay *The Stuff of Bits*, um, also talks about this idea of a you know a simple massification uh, might see a single cell and ten million cells as different parts of the same linear continuum, but that's not the same as talking about a human arm and the scale. We can think of it as a dimension along which different objects exist. So I want to bring this back again to um, Sarah Ahmed and to the ever giving, uh, ever given, and what a queer perspective might bring on this for us. So there was something in the kind of that moment of the ever giving getting like embarrassingly, hilariously stuck, that kind of felt like this moment of release that all the weirdness is about scale and size and power just were kind of let loose into the world. And there's kind of, I think there are echoes here for um, how Sarah Ahmed talks about, there's this moment here of how we can reconceptualize um, existing power and positions um, and find ways to move through them differently through kind of a queer perspective, which I would ask for a queer perspective around scale. So we might challenge, she talks about, the vantage points set up um, in otherwise normative, uh, normative spaces. We might ask what the missing angles are if we're looking at things one way, but looking at them another kind of reveals a different aspect of their scalarity. Um, we might move around something so that we see more than its profile. We might see the missing parts. We might also ask why certain objects and certain vantage points are present. You know, why are some things moved into the foreground and why are some things concealed in the background? Um, and this builds again on um, Legacy Russell's um, excellent work around in, in her manifesto Glitch Feminism, where she identifies that the specificities of digital spaces, you know, their slipperiness, their imperfect capture of the world and their relationship to the embodiment of the people who use them in those moments of messiness and you know and glitch and strangeness offer further possibilities for embodying these spaces in new ways and for challenging existing power structures and we can think about this in terms of desire too 
Lauren Ballant and Michael Warner talk about queer space as being a space of entrances, exits, unsystematized lines of acquaintance, projecting horizons, typifying examples, alternate routes, blockages, incommensurate, um, incommensurate geographies. Um, and Sarah Ahmed with this, you know, talks about how we can think about which desires get foregrounded, the comparative size, the scale of the objects that are associated with certain desires. Um, she talks about how we can find even joy and excitement in the horror. And we can think about what a desire for scale means and what it conceals. Thank you very much.